it does seem mildly appropriate to be singing about uh, hail, snow, cloud and winds uh, today, as you look out and see the snow still falling but maybe not lying, uh, we recognise all of these things as uh, God's uh, ultimate creation, whatever place they play in the original creation or the new heavens and the earth, not so sure, certainly the cold will not be there. Thank the Lord for these things. Okay, I'd like us to go back to uh, Genesis chapter 2 and verse 19 to 25. And the words that we have in these verses and also in, in this whole theme are, as we've seen before, they're really weighted, they're carefully expressed, they're expressed um, in formulaic ways. And God is telling us about beginnings, and He's telling about His original creation. It might be very far from uh, our understanding and from our experience, and part of that is cultural, part of that is because of rebellion and because of sin, which we'll look at a little bit this evening, and partly it's just because the thinking today is so different on so many different levels. If I were to mention woman's role, if I were to mention marriage uh, between a man and a woman, if I were to mention uh, sovereignty of God, and all of these things, these are things which are not popular concepts and popular thinking. And we need to try and unpack a little bit of what God is saying to us here, um, trying not to be prejudiced, uh, trying not to be uh, defensive. Uh, but also trying to be honest to Scripture and to what Scripture has in front of us here. And it's, it's very, very significant. Uh, again, uh, what I'd like to say is that I think sometimes uh, the Bible, and particularly Genesis and the first three chapters, uh, raise more questions than they give answers. And they don't give us all the answers. There's lots of things we don't know. But we are given principles... But more importantly, we're reminded that we need to look at Genesis through the eyes as well of the cross. We need to have Jesus as the focus of our worship, and Jesus as the focus even of our study of Genesis and of beginnings, because it's all hugely significant and related. And as we saw last week, the, 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 the talk of the Lord God, the name that is given to God in, these, in some of these verses, the Lord, is the re redeeming name of God. It's the personal covenant name of God. So that we look at it even within that context of our sinfulness, our separation from God, His answer to that through Jesus Christ, and how that affects how we look at Genesis. So that's kind of as a way of introduction. I want to say these things uh, today. But I do want to speak about and uh, kind of try and unpack a little bit. Uh, it will not be uh, exhaustive by any means, but it will hope, hopefully open up a little uh, bit of these verses. And this and this evening's I will put into questions as well for the city group, not next week, but the week after that. So we'll have another time to be able to discuss some of these things in the more informal setting of city group. But what I want to start off with is by looking at ver from verses 18 at 20 uh, at the way this is pictured. Because what we have, remember, in Genesis 1 is the whole of creation being made. And then in Genesis 2, we go back to uh, with a little bit more detail into the creation of Adam and Eve and the uniqueness of that. And the fact that we're, uh, mankind is made in God's image and all that comes from that, uh, men and women together. Uh, made in God's image. So we come back to that and he, God recounts to Moses a little bit of what was happening. We don't have things about time or what all was involved and there's lots of uh, unanswerable questions, lots of imponderable. But in the first couple of verses in 18 and 19 and, and 20, we have uh, a little bit about Adam and Adam being created and some of the work he had to do in that kind of uh, ambassadorial uh, kind of uh, uh, ruler, uh, sovereign care over the universe that he gave that he had to name the animals. And we recognize that in this little section, God's reminding us of something that he hasn't mentioned before. It's very clear in the language. It's something that, that is, has been alien previously 
to the creation. What do you remember about the first chapter of Genesis? What comes across a lot in the first chapter of, of Genesis? There's a lot of things that, and God said, and God said. We saw that before. That's repeated many times. And then we also said, at the end of each verse, it said, and it was good. 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 Six times at the end of each creative day, we have this great declaration by God because He wants us to know and remind us that His original creation was an absolutely good, good, perfect, beautiful, loving creation. And then something alien comes into this passage where God Himself says, it is not good. Something's not good in His creation. It's not good for the man to be alone. The Lord God said it is not good for the man to be alone. And that's a very clear contrast between the earlier uh, descriptions of the creation that he had made. Uh, and it's a breaking into this incompleted creation, in other words, that God hadn't yet finished his creation, but it wasn't good for uh, Adam at that point to be alone. I will make a helper suitable for him. And uh, there was an incompleteness Man on his own is incomplete. Humanity is a, a corporate reality, and it is not good for people to be alone as a, a, a way of living, as a way of life uh, in that unfulfilled, lonely, separate uh, environment. You see, Adam, uh, up to this point, had been, uh, we're told in verse 19, he'd been, he'd been beginning to fulfill the role. He, had, he was given this role, this kind of um, biological, scientific, whatever you call it, role of naming and, and being among the animals, uh, creating structure and order within them. And uh, they were being brought to him, and he'd name them, and uh, all the livestock, the birds of the air, beasts of the field. Can't understand how that was done. It's very different from what uh, we can envisage and know, but there's this uh, sovereign role that he is given. And as he's doing that work, uh, it's a solitary work. I don't know what happened or what was involved, but it seemed to be a, a, a solitary work. And as he uh, met with and, and interacted with uh, the animal kingdom and, and the wider world of, of the day, it only exposed his loneliness and his, or his alone, aloneness, should I say. He wasn't lonely in the sense of he had a relationship with God. He had this incredible uh, relationship with, with God, but there was no one suitable to share life with him. No one who shared his kind of earthiness, his humanity. God was God. The animals were animals. The world was the world, and here was mankind created in God's image, but not able to enjoy the fullness of that image because he had no one to enjoy it with. God said, it's not good. I will make a helper suitable for him. And that's much, I'll go on to say more about this, that's much broader than simply uh, the creation of a man and a woman together in a marital marriage relationship. It's speaking beyond that to the corporate nature of our human beingness, the, the nature of us as people. The absolute solitude was never the intention for mankind never the intention for humankind uh, that we are people made to be in community. And I'm not speaking here just about marriage, I'm speaking far broader than that. that it, this is not about singleness and marriage per se, although it is part of that. It's this whole recognition that as people, we were made for companionship, for social fellowship, for interaction with one another, for family for friendship, yes, and for uh, marriage also. Um, we recognize that. And the church plays an important part in that uh, recreation of that in Christ. And it's hugely significant and hugely important that we recognize, even though it's broken and tainted, and confused and divided because of sin and because of what sin did. And it's only as we see what God originally made, intended for us, that we begin to see the utter devastation and uh, the deep-seated 
dysfunction and brokenness that sin has brought into the world, that we, we recognize that this is how God created us for society. Adam and Eve is the creation of society. It's the creation of humanity together. It's the creation of um, family and of uh, neighborhood and community and all that goes with that, spoken in very um, uh, prototypical terms here. Uh, it's, it's, it's just, it's the genesis of it. It's the very, it's, it's not its full fruition. We, we see that growing and developing. But this is prototype society, prototype humanity, and it's humanity that is, it's not good that mankind is alone, that, you, that individuals are alone. That is the recognition that God is uh, expressing to us here. Now, we know that sin has impacted that massively and hugely. But we also, I think we recognize that, that fundamental reality. Now, for some of us, it may be easier. For some of us, it might be more difficult. Uh, for some of us, we sense loneliness. For some of us, we crave uh, uh, aloneness sometimes. Sometimes that's necessary, sometimes that's good. But as, as God intended us, we recognize that we are created for society. Now, why, where do we see that? Or where do we see the opposite of that, even in broken society in which we live? Well, we see it in prison, don't we? We see that punishment is separating people out. And solitary confinement is the expression of that at its most. No, don't send me to the... Don't send me to the, the pit or don't send me to the, the black room. Don't send me into solitary confinement. Don't close the door and close the window on humanity and on, on inter, social intercourse with people. But that is, that's the, the ultimate, isn't it? It's the ultimate, it's the ultimate punishment. Uh, unwilling solitary confinement. Because that's not what we're made for. We crave is society and fellowship and friendship and family. And we know it's broken and we know it's painful and we know sometimes it doesn't quite work out that way. But that is what we see that it is not good for mankind to be alone, that we weren't created to be alone. And sin has impacted that hugely. So today, in applying that, I reject the false piety of people who say, as Christians, well, all I need is Christ. I don't need the church and all the, the, the pain and the suffering of being part of a church where everyone's such a pain in the neck. I don't, I don't accept that. It's a get out. It's a, way, it's, a, it's, it's a false piety that says all you need is Christ at that level. Yes, for making us right with God, all we need is Jesus Christ and his finished work. Of course we know that. But don't take that to another extreme and use it to uh, allow yourself not to uh, be exposed to the pain and suffering and joy and fellowship and friendship and highs and lows of being part of God's people and being part of community. Oh, of course it's inconvenient and of course it's painful sometimes, but it's also how God intended us to be. And it's a begin to be a reflection of grace at work and of heaven uh, anticipated. So I, I reject, and the Bible rejects the false piety that says all I need is Christ and going up a hillside to worship him. And that's where I get my fullness and my completeness. Because it's a cop-out. You're not dealing with your sinful nature if you're saying all you need is Christ. Because he's asked us to express our dependence on Christ through our interaction with one another and through our worship with one another and through our commitment to one another and are giving to one another and receiving from one another part of this godly society. We are the body of Christ. We're not the fingertip of Christ on our own somewhere. We're the body of Christ together. He's the head. And we reflect his headship by our submission to one another and by our submission uh, to Christ through loving and serving one another. So I reject that false piety. And the Bible does also. But also, and as Christians, then the church has a great role to counteract aloneness. And lo loneliness is a big, huge part of life today. Huge part of people's lives today. Increasingly so. As we individualize our lives, 
as we can do our shopping from the, in front of the computer, and as we can do our social life from in front of the computer, and as we can do almost nearly everything in front of the computer. It, it seems like we have lots of friends. It seems like we're in great social intercourse, but we're on our own. We can be in a dark room on our own. We can do all these things on our own. We can work from home. We can do all these things from home on our own. And the result is that there can be a huge amount of loneliness in people's lives, a huge amount of non-facial, verbal contact with people. You know, when we struggle, when we do things, when we do things badly, what's the worst thing in the world to do? Deal with it by email. Don't do it. Don't deal with these issues and difficulties and struggles and problems by email. Go and speak to someone. Be face to face. Be in, in, in interaction. See their face. See their up. See their down. See their disappointment. See their, their smiles. See their approval and disapproval. But see it and sense it and feel it and be part of that community. Don't deal with the computer screen all the time. We need to be people who are counteracting the loneliness. There's nothing wrong with the computer and, and all that goes with it. But we need to see it in the light of grace. God in Christ didn't save us at a distance. I'm looking for the word. He didn't save us remotely. You know, we can do so many things remotely today, can't we? And it seems like fellowship and friendship, but he didn't redeem us remotely. He didn't. He came, and Philippians 2 reminds us that he emptied himself. He poured himself into this role of servant leadership and servant savior in order to redeem us. He interacted with his disciples. He, he accepted their, their ongoing failure. And he, he made time. He got up tremendously early before anyone else so he could be in fellowship with the Father and then be in fellowship with all these people who didn't understand him and who didn't see what he'd come to do and rejected him and who, who judged him. And the church has this hugely important role because it's not good for man to be alone to, to deal with that and to be a community. But, you know, sometimes people, they'll talk about St. Columbus and they'll say, they'll say various things in judgment on St. Columbus, I think, sometimes. And they'll say things like, oh, it's great, things are a good church. I really love your fellowship and the hospitality. I love the way you do hospitality and things like that. And there's sometimes there's a kind of there's an undercurrent of saying, well, that's quite nice, but it's not really that important. It's nice that you do it. It's a nice additional thing, but it's not really that important. Uh, and there's other more important things. Preaching is not that great, and the, the worship is not that great, or whatever else we do is not that great. But I like the way you do hospitality. And people sometimes say, that's the only reason why people come, because they get a free meal every so often. You know? And I say it's absolutely and completely and totally crucial that we engage in that ministry of hospitality because it's a reflection of the Trinity and it's a reflection of heaven and it's a reflection of community and that we're not just a bunch of gathered individual Christians who find their completeness only in Christ and come together just because, well, that's convention. If this is all we're given is God this one hour in a day and we live our lives just on our own the rest of the time, we completely misunderstood grace and the gospel and the community of the gospel and the cost of the gospel to our lives. Hospitality is not an added extra. I wouldn't pour heart and soul into it if it was an added extra. It's crucial to our understanding of the gospel and of grace and of the fact that we aren't to be alone. And that's how we're to reflect uh, the life of Christ in the church. We're a family of people together. And it's a family of people, single, uh, young, old, widowed, married with family together, uh, and moving beyond just the, the nuclear picture of family together. And it's that recognition that we're a family of God together as a people. Now, I speak here to married couples, and I speak sometimes to families, and I include myself. Sometimes, as families... And as married couples, or when, especially when we get married, and there's a lot of people get married here, there's a lot of young people who go through university and meet uh, the love of their life and get married and so on. And sometimes the tendency can be to just become tremendously insular. You know, once you get married, then you just focus in on yourself. And then even more so, once you get family, then you've got no time for anything else. 
And that is something to be avoided and the temptation is need to be something we deal with because we recognize uh, that we are a family together beyond the nuclear family of marriage and beyond the nuclear family of, of, of marriage with kids. We recognize that we are a family together beyond that and we need not to, to uh, move into self-sufficiency when we move into a different state of, of living, maritally or otherwise. Yes, there's changes. Of course there's changes. And of course there's different perspectives and emphasis. But we need to be aware that we don't simply then, oh, well, I've, well I'm all right now, I'm married. and well, I've got a family, that's great. And, and ignore the realities of a, a wider family that we have responsibility for in Christ. What a great thing it is to be able to open our, our, our marriages and our, our families and our children to the whole church. Wonderful privilege. That is uh, God's pattern for us. Adam's aloneness. It was the one thing that God said was not good about the creation. That makes it hugely significant because we said the language here is very weighted. It's very carefully chosen. There's not a word wasted. So we find then, and then move on to the creation of Eve. Adam uh, is not good uh, to be alone, and so God creates for him Eve. And I want to say two things about this. I want to say, firstly, that they are created equal. That's very important for all the misogynists in church. Humanity is created equal. Man and woman created equal in God's image. We saw that in chapter 1. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created a male and female. He created them. They are created in God's image. Absolutely and completely equal. But I'm going to go on to say they are also created different. And that's what I want to finish with today. They're created equal and they're created different. So there's this great unity in the human uh, race. That Eve, as God tells us, is taken from man, taken from, uh, sacrificially taken from his side. And uh, he's crea- she's created uh, so that there's the sameness of substance. Okay? Man comes from the dust. So man and woman come, uh, as it's implied, from the dust together. They're the same stuff. We're made of the same stuff, to put it theologically. We're made of the same stuff. That's what God has made us. He made us together, man and woman together. And uh, we come from this one, this one family. The humanity uh, comes from this family. And, and biblically and, and theologically, that's important. Uh, as we rec- when we, we come to recognize Adam uh, breaking trust with God and breaking his important representative role for humanity uh, uh, in how he, he, he falls away from God. There's this unity of the human race, both reflecting God's image. There's this whole idea, as we've seen from God saying it's not good that man is alone. There's this whole picture and this whole image of neither being complete without the other. That men and women together make up humanity. Man and women together make up marriage at that level. Uh, but at a wider level, there's a complementarity between uh, humanity and still a distinction. But there is that great sense in which we need each other. And I'll go on to say a little bit more about that uh, in uh, the roles that we play. And there may be significance. It may be uh, a little bit of spiritualizing. But it may be that uh, there is biblical significance in the fact that a uh, uh, woman is taken out of the side, out of the rib, as it were, of humanity, out of, of mankind, out of man, out of Adam, uh, not taken from his head to rule over him, not taken from his feet to be subjugated to him, but to be beside, to be protected, to protect, and to be near his heart. There's all these kind of images that we can potentially at least take out of this um, uh, literary picture of the humanity 
uh, or of the creation of humanity. But this, born, this basic equality is hugely significant. And as I say, that we look at it with slightly colored and skewed uh, lenses because of sin and because of the distortion that sin has brought in to our lives and because of the way that it's been abused and uh, mistreated by men and by women particularly, uh, sorry, by men particularly, sorry, bad mistake, and uh, how that has happened uh, throughout time. There is, uh, and what I want to say is that there's a, qual- a fundamental and basic equality which is different from uniformity. Okay, that, that's an important thing for us to understand, especially in our church and in our tradition, which has focused a lot on uniformity. We've focused on uniformity of worship, for example, that everyone should or not to worship the same. And we've possibly moved uh, away from the, uh, the beauty of, of uh, what we have uh, in diversity in Christ while retaining significant and important and, and fundamental principles that we never move from. We have moved our uniformity further down the line to second and third and fourth principles of secondary importance. But uniformity, being the same, is not the same as equality. We can be equal, as I'll go on to say, without being the same. And I think that's significant. There is no place, and we need to fight against this because we're sinners. There's no place for unbiblical discrimination, for any domination. Our idea of uh, uh, domination, particularly from men, which has been the case over centuries, stereotyping of uh, rules in an unhelpful way, prejudice, or as I mentioned earlier, misogyny. And I'm obviously focusing more on the men's side of things because I'm a man. I leave the women to be aware of the dangers that they also face uh, in rejecting the teaching of Scripture. So in the provision of Eve, uh, we are told that uh, God uh, creates these two in his own image, uh, incomplete uh, without uh, each other, uh, equally created before God. But they're also created different. They have a different fundamental name, man and woman. And they have a different role in life. By nature, uh, a woman is different from a man. Now again, uh, we're coming into kind of fragile and sensitive territory in the society and in the thinking in which we live, and we need to think about that and, and be sensitive to it and, and be aware of it. But we recognize, and I hope we recognize, that uh, the, the difference between men and women is not simply anatomical. It's more than that. It's not simply that we look different. There is a physical difference, there's a physiological difference, there's a psychological difference. There, that we are different people. We, we are different the way we're made up. It's not just merely a physical difference between the two. And uh, we're not uh, unisex at, one, at that level. There is equality, but there is also difference. And that is how we were created. That is part of the glory of humanity, is there's not this kind of uniform um, mass of humanity. But we're we're all unique, yes, and as sexes, we're we're also unique. Uh, Different by nature, by by our physical reality, and, and even by the way we think. Anyone who's married knows that. Any woman who is married to a man knows that, any man who is married to a woman, any woman who works with a man knows that, any man who works with a woman knows that, uh, our sisters and brothers, we know that, we know we're different, we know we think differently, we've got different emphasis, we have different attitudes, we have different ways of thinking, because that's how God made us, with great complementarity, but with a balance to one another both of which reflect God. There's different aspects of God, the great God, reflected in humanity and men and women together, which is why society is so important. But there's also a difference in role, and here I'm really moving into extremely difficult and dangerous territory. We're told here that he was, uh, Adam was given a helper suitable for him. 
and, and that, that language of, of helper is, is also very significant. Now, for most people today, that would be taken as a demeaning role. It's a man's going to in charge, he's in charge, and he's naming the animals, and the woman's just there to kind of make the dinner and help him. But that, that's, not, that's not the picture that we're given here, uh, and that's not what the word means. It's not in any sense a, 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 a negative or a, a, a negatively supporting role. It's not a demeaning role in any sense whatsoever. In fact, it's used most often. Do you know what it's used most often in the Bible? It's used most often of God helping us. That's what it's used most often of. That we need God. That we need His help. We need His strength. We need His guidance. We need His protection. And that's the word that's used here of the woman who was given for the man. That the man needed her. There's a sense of, the, of, of joint need for one another. And uh, that she makes up what he lacks in, in a, a way and in a... Uh, a hum- humanity point of view, to insist, to assist, to, to encourage, to help, to be there, to make up for his weakness, to make up for his incompleteness in many ways. It's not a weak term. It's that whole recognition that equality doesn't mean uniformity, doesn't mean the same thing. It does imply leadership. It does imply that role and, and it implies it here, but it's, it's taught clearly throughout the rest of Scripture. In marriage, the leadership of, of the husband, and also in the church, the leadership of men in the church. Now, that's a contentious and a difficult issue. I recognize that. But that is the pan- I, I can't say anything for society and work because the Bible doesn't really say much about that. Uh, but, but within a Christian context, and I want to finish and bring, bring it around to this to conclude with, because we can only see in these areas marriage and of the church, when we come under, because of sin and because of redemption, when we come under Christ and recognize Christ and see His picture and His willingness uh, to uh, restore what has been lost. So there's this great sense in which God has appointed uh, people with different roles uh, of leadership, of support, of strength, of uh, uh, delegated wisdom of knowledge and of partnership and of teamwork together. And we, we recognize that. Uh, and what, what I want to, want to say about this uh, is that uh, leadership, uh, speaking to the men here, uh, the men who are in church or leadership or in, in marriage, uh, head of the home at that level, the, the leadership model we have is Jesus Christ, okay? He's a servant leader. A servant leader uh, who washes the disciples' feet. I just want to leave it at that and remember that that's so, so hugely significant. And I want to remind the women uh, similarly under Christ that uh, Christ is head of, of the man and of, of humanity, but God is the head of Christ. And there's no there is no hint of subordination there in a negative way. There's no inequality between God the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, even though God is the Father, uh, God is the head of the Son. What we see is, is the Son willingly pouring Himself out into humanity in order to be the Redeemer. And that's the model for the, the woman also in marriage and in the church to be the one who recognizes equality as God was equal, God the Father is equal, God the Son, but also a recognition of God's model and God's pattern of leadership uh, within the church and within marriage uh, as being one that we pour ourselves into willingly because we recognize that's God's model. And it becomes a partnership. There's no place for dictatorial leadership. There's no place for uh, the oppression uh, of, hum- of, of, of men or women, which has so often been used, hasn't it? Uh, and some, so often the Bible has been used as an excuse for that. It, we must look through the prism of the cross and see the submission that Christ offered in order to redeem us. And as leaders to see the submission of servant leadership and as, as partners to see 
the submission uh, to God's pattern within that. And recognize that. And so there's this picture of humanity, this picture of God's pattern within the church, within a Christian marriage. And can I say that's why Christian marriage is so significant? It's why it's important that Christians marry Christians, not only because it's taught and commanded, but because it makes sense, doesn't it? How hard is it in a a marital relationship where one has Christ as Lord and the other doesn't? How difficult is that? How difficult must be every day when that's the case, unless our priorities are completely different from Christ's? How difficult is that? He asks us to do that because he knows it's right and because we are taking his role and we're taking his pattern into our lives. We're taking Christ into our lives. And it's where his lordship comes in. See, if if he's not our Lord, then if we just come to church on a Sunday and leave again, then it doesn't really matter who we marry or what we do because he's not Lord of our lives. He's Lord of possibly an hour on a Sunday morning. But are we willing, men and women together, to submit to leaders and, and congregation together, all of us together? That's a, great, that's a great battle of my life, great fight that I fight every day. Am I submitted to Christ? Are you submitted to Christ? Am I? That's a great battle that I face every single moment of every day. Am I doing my will? Am I doing what everyone else wants me to do? Or am I doing what Christ wants? So we have that role and that difference. And we do also have the 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 core and fundamental teaching on marriage here. For this reason, a man will leave his father and mother, be united to the wife, and the two will become one flesh. Jesus reiterates that in Matthew 19, and Paul does in Ephesians chapter 5. It's the first marriage. It's the basic fundamental structure, foundation of society. It's not the only only expression of society, but it is the fundamental and basic one, both a physical union and a loving commitment. Marriage, God's way, between one man and one woman. Controversial today. But the legitimacy of sexual activity, the legitimacy of uh, joy and pleasure, of uh, commitment and a family to one another comes uh, through this pattern that God has given. Now, that's all upside down. Of course it is. Absolutely. But we recognize that that is God's pattern. And we can only ever appreciate that when we see God nailed to a cross for our sins. If that doesn't matter to you, then none of this will either. If his pattern of living and his moral structure for life is abhorrent, then so I I would imagine is Christ on the cross. He is our only hope. He's our only, the only glasses through which we can see the truth. Have you been, this, have you been, I, I, I'm speaking for, from ignorance here. I've never been to see a 3D film. I think it's a waste of money. It's expensive enough going to cinema these days. But going to a 3D and wearing these ridiculous glass plastic specs is something I'm not willing to do. But I can imagine if you go in a 3D film and you don't wear the glasses because you're pig stubborn like I am, then you would have a pretty rotten experience of the film. And everyone else alongside you would be and moving back and seeing things and then you'd be kind of sitting there and it'd all be fuzzy and blurred and stupid. Well, that's exactly the truth about grace. Unless we are wearing the spectacles of grace, Scripture seems stupid to us because we need to see it through Jesus and through what he has done and through his excruciatingly committed love that would set us free from the sin that separates us. Maybe you don't think yourself maybe particularly as a sinner. But can you see God's model? And can you see God's purpose? And can you see God's love? If you can't see these things, it's because... We need grace. We need to submit to Jesus Christ and say to him, I can't be in relationship with you again, which I was created to be in, unless 
I come through Jesus and through the fact that he died on the cross for my sins in order to make that way open. And then we can look at things with the eyes of love. That's why I think apologetics is so difficult to be effective. I think it's important. I think we need to defend our faith. We need to have an intelligent defense of our faith. But it's difficult to, it will never be the case we can argue people into the kingdom. Why? Because unless they see grace and the loveliness of Jesus, they will never come through reason only and through mere intellectual argument. We need to be the place where we will fall on our knees and say, Lord Jesus Christ, you made me. And you made me out of dust. And I'm not God. And I'm not sovereign. And I'm not my own king. You are. And you came to die to set me free and to restore and redeem and buy back what uh, was originally at the beginning. So I hope maybe that helps a little bit. Amen. Let's pray together. Lord God, we ask and pray that you'd help us and guide us and bless us as we close our worship today. For Jesus' sake. Amen.